I'm looking at these general programs. I'm looking at kind of general nutrition uh, advice. What should I apply to myself? I would base it off of your goals, your history, and your behaviors, not how you look, not necessarily your body type or even your gender, uh, or even necessarily your age. I think it has much more to do with <coughs> goals and how my body feels and how I respond and my behaviors. That makes the most uh, sense across the board. So, but it is. It's it's usually pretty smart marketing that they that they do that. Boom, we're back. It's Mind Pump time. New month, new promotion. Uh, but before we get into that, here's a giveaway. MAPS Anabolic, the program that started it all. You can win it for free. Here's what you got to do. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to the program that started the revolution. Also, here's the sale for the month. It's a big one. We have a shredded summer bundle that's 50% off. This includes MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Hit. MAPS Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. So this is great for getting leaner, for fat loss. That bundle's already discounted, but you can take an additional 50% off. Also, we have an individual MAPS workout program that's on sale, MAPS Hit. This is high-intensity interval training done right. Burn a ton of calories in a short period of time, short, intense workouts. It's a lot of fun, very effective for like five or six weeks. That program is also 50% off. So if you're interested, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. And then use the code June50 for that discount. All right, here comes the show. Body type based diets and workout programs, largely fake news. <laughs> fake news. Yeah. There's a lot of that circulating around right now. I know. Yeah, I saw I saw some people asking that question um on the Instagram, on like our if Instagram. you're built like this, if you're built like that, if you're this is how you should eat, this is how you should train. So it's okay. Marketing tactics 101. Uh, complete bullshit, or do you think there's some some truth and validity to it? I think there's a little bit of uh, of general truth into some of those. Like, for example, if you're a hard gainer versus you know maybe somebody who tends to gain weight a little more easy. However, when you consider a person's goals, training history, and then just just their them as an individual, you can throw all that out the window. For example, uh, traditional. Wisdom, it's not even wisdom, but traditionally they would say someone who's a hard gainer or an ectomorph, right? The real skinny person who has a tough time gaining weight versus an endomorph, someone who's like gains weight easier and, and heavier. <coughs> they would say, well, an endomorph has an easier time gaining weight. That also means they have an easier time building muscle. Not true. I've met ectomorphs who built muscle very easy with strength training. And I've met endomorphs where it was really hard. Yeah to get their body to adapt with muscle building. Now so. that's true, but I think that's more of an anomaly and that's the reason why they can get away with this. Maybe. I think that- Really? Like yeah, I, maybe. I can like on one hand count how many times that's been true in my career where the opposite was true. It's almost always when you have somebody who is big boned and hard, have a hard time losing weight, they typically can put on muscle Okay. Easier than the, the the skinny ectomorph. So here's where I'll challenge that. If you control for calories, I, I disagree. In other words, it's if you take the ectomorph, that has a tough time gaining weight, and you put them in a surplus, um, then they gain – sometimes, depending on their genetics, they gain muscle. And there's I know a lot of examples okay, that's of fair. This. Okay, that's fair. But yeah. I, think, I think that that's, that's part of why this works, though, is because yes. you, you are factoring in – the behaviors of that yeah. that type of person, yeah. the behavior of the, the the skinny kid who can't gain weight, also meal skips, eats small meals, moves a lot, and stuff like that. The the behaviors of the kid who's oh really overweight and has a hard time losing weight, yeah. doesn't move as much, eats a lot of calories. So yeah, so okay, I'll, I'll give you that, but that's why this works. That's why I think so many why there's so many people that continue to market this way, yeah. because what ends up happening is. Some kid, or it doesn't have to be kids, so some individual gets this marketed to them and they go, Oh my God, that's me. I'm that's the, me. I I'm relate the, to that. That's, yeah, that's, all these overgeneralizations, that's what it is. It's like they're trying to throw chum out there and see like who it resonates with. And a lot of times that's how then they can kind of corral them into the that's specific plan. Same there. reason why they'll sell uh, protein powder for women. Protein powder for men, right? Creatine for women, creatine for men. I've seen that a million it's times. It's just human psychology. They're trying to tap into marketing. that. Yeah, yeah. Marketing. yeah, it's marketing. And really, if, you, if you're if you looking for a workout program or nutrition program that's general, so you're not hiring a coach, right? To design Because that's ultimate. The ultimate program, the ultimate nutrition program is individualized. There's nothing that can beat something that's individualized, especially designed by a really good experienced coach. Yeah. But let's say you're not doing that and you're looking general. So you're not going to hire someone, but you're like, okay, 
I'm looking at these general programs. I'm looking at kind of general nutrition uh, advice. What should I apply to myself? I would base it off of your goals, your history, and your behaviors, not how you look, not necessarily your body type or even your gender, uh, or even necessarily your age. I think it has much more to do with <coughs> goals and how my body feels and how I respond and my behaviors. That makes the most uh, sense across the board. So, but it is. It's it's usually pretty smart marketing that they that they do that. You know, along the lines of talking about nutrition and stuff, I want to bring up something that you had actually brought up uh, not that long ago. That I now I don't know if it was. Did you just read the whole diet on DK Metcalf? The football player with the skit eats the skittles. Yeah, that's the, the guy. And so okay, candy. That's the guy. it is the guy. Now, did you just see that and it was recent news, or was that old news and you were just remembering that? Because I now I see it going viral on social media. I had just read it. Oh, okay. So, so it was recent. Recent. Joe DeFranco posted yes. about it, and I saw the same article. Was it relatively new? Yeah. Relatively oh, okay. Because I thought that was old information. What a I'm great like, example of genetics, by the way. Well, okay. So here's <laughs> yeah. why. I'm, here's why I'm bringing it up. So I've seen it. Uh, Joe, a bunch of other people posted it. Um, I was on uh, what's his name's page. Uh, more plates, more dates. Mm -hmm. I, I like his stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. he, put, he puts out really good content. Shout out to him. Um, and he actually posted a, a, about. D DK Metcalf, the actual clip of him in the interview talking about his diet. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shannon Sharp is the interviewer, the uh, Hall of Fame football player. Uh, and he's basically razzing him like, bro, what are you doing? Like, you you got to get on this. You, you got to take care of your body. And he's and then, of course, more plates, more dates has a huge following. So just like hundreds of trainers are on there, like are totally like, yeah, imagine this guy's a freak of nature already. Imagine if he's and I think I was the only person that got on there and said, well, it's not that simple. No. You know, uh, he's a he's at the professional level. He's been eating this way for most of his life as a as a football player. And you have to factor in the psychological part. Yeah. That's huge. And it's and, predictable at this point. Yeah. Now all of us nutrition nuts and fitness nerds know that if someone eats bags of Skittles, you know, and R Red Bull Rockstar type drinks, and then they only have one meal in the day and they're a 265 pound beast like that. He's probably not getting all the nutrients his body should get. And if you were to optimize that, he potentially would perform better, potentially. But if that fucks with his psychology, even in the slightest bit, even the the benefits of the nutrition value that he's yeah. now getting could could be out, outweighed by the negative Dude, effects of it messing let with me his head. You definitely have to consider that. Let me tell you something, okay? If you've ever worked with uh, high-level athletes, uh, just as even, even high-level high school or college athletes, they're the most uh, ritualistic um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, people you'll ever find. They, they're the most superstitious people you'll yeah. ever find. Like, oh, before every big game, I eat, you know, uh, my 12-piece nugget and I have a Diet Coke, you know, and that's what I do before every game, right? And if you take that away from them because you're like, that's unhealthy, messes with their psyche and then they don't play as well. And this is true. In fact, yeah. I've talked to NFL coaches and trainers, or should I say trainers, and they'll say, you don't want to mess with stuff too much because what they've done is work for them. And when you screwed up a little bit, like here's a more obvious example, right? You look at like um, the movement patterns of some mm -hmm. high-level athletes, or you look at the feet of like, pro NBA players all messed up and you think they should do correctional exercise. Like that would fix their problem. No, they've learned how to play as well as they do, but with their compensations, you go to correct imbalances, they're going to move differently and it'll hurt their game. Yeah. So yeah. it's not as easy as, uh, as people that think. That was one of those that like kind of blew my mind as a young trainer. You're like, always, you see the imbalances, you see things yep. that you can help, you know, fix. But uh, yeah, it, for them to learn an all new way of moving and it's going to take years for them to repattern a lot of those things and, and correctly. And so, you know, why, like, is that really something that is going to provide value to that, that athlete at that level, who's already very comfortable with their body and those like, you know, how, how do you, uh, uh, you know, apply this uh, at a high level? Yeah. We're not, we're not talking about a high school kid who's still maturing and growing, developing, and, developing yeah. and is, you know, at a, at, you know, even if he's at a high level at high school, he's still got a lot of learning and changing to happen. And so why not start to help this kid out with the diet? You are talking about a you know Pro Bowl athlete that's been in the NFL for several years now yeah. that has been doing this already for decades of his life and has figured it out. And so, yes, all of us nutrition nerds and stuff want to get on there and pick it apart and be like, oh, and then that's like what the thread, like everyone's saying is like some people, some people come to his defense. Well, what if in that one meal he's getting all his macros? Highly unlikely, right? Yeah. One meal, <laughs> I doubt a 260 pound man is getting, that's playing at that high level is getting enough of his macro balance in there. But 
I could make the case, though, that his body has definitely adapted to what he's been giving it, and he's performing at a very high level, yeah. and that the benefit of optimizing his nutrition may give him very little in comparison to what it could fuck with him psychologically. Yeah, and also, this is the other thing. People confuse uh, healthy and longevity with extreme performance. Yeah. There's, there's totally different beasts. Yeah, improving performance will improve your health at some point. And then at some point, improving your performance, you start to see a decline in health. We're talking about very high-performing extreme athletes. Look at the lifespan of the average NFL player. It's in the 60s. They don't even live as long as the average obese, <laughs> unhealthy American. Yeah. Why? Well, they push themselves so hard and they get into the equivalent of like three car crashes every single game. Like this is not – what they do has nothing to do with health. What they're doing has everything to do with extreme performance. So, yeah, we I could look at his diet and say I could definitely make you healthier – but to look at his diet and say, I can make you perform better, especially at someone at that level, is a little bit arrogant and, and naive because it's way more complicated than we think. And it's not just the nutrients that they're taking in. The psychological piece plays such a big role in an athlete's performance at that level. It plays such a massive role that the top performing athletes at that level, they definitely have the genetics. They definitely have the skill and the ability, but they also have a psychological mindset that separates them from other players. I used to see this with um, high-level grappling and mixed martial arts. There were guys yeah. in the gym practicing who were amazing at grappling, amazing at mixed martial arts, but when they went to compete, they would suck because they couldn't <laughs> handle yeah. – the pressure and what's well, going on. There's a, there's a, there's a whole host of things a that's lot happening. Of the rituals. I mean, it's it's something that like you lean on that to to be able to have that freedom of being calm in in a very stressful situation. And yeah. Like the best of the best. When, when you when the game's on the line, when it's that last second shot, like the ones that do the best, they're the ones that are the calmest out there. And it's it's that all those rituals like you know, are a part of that process of being able to get in that kind of a flow state. Well, that's what I think people don't understand is that the, you know, what we don't know is that, you know, maybe this kid when he was young, you know, always had this bag of Skittles <laughs> yeah, before games. See? And when he did the that association, yeah. yeah. And so he has this association with fun and life was simpler yeah. when I was, you know, 12 and playing with my buddies. And like, it's become this thing that he always does. And it puts him in this really positive, happy, mm -hmm. calm place. Mm -hmm. And then he goes out on the field place. Now would a balanced meal support probably more energy and potential recovery from the game. Absolutely. Yeah. But at the cost of him getting out of that mindset that he's trained himself to be in by eating this these these same foods, uh, and it's really it's really hard for fitness people to grasp this because it's just like this can't be possible. Yeah. Like, well, because you're must not be so inflamed. Yeah, well, yeah. You know why though? Inky. I and I, I I understand. I empathize with coaches and trainers. When you're a trainer, um, in, look, I trained people for two decades. Do you know how many people I trained at that level of performance? Zero. Uh, every yeah. single person I trained, uh, almost every single person I trained, was an everyday average person. And I did train some athletes that competed at pretty high levels. Not that level, but some pretty high levels. So what I observed worked for the average person, for the most part. When you're dealing with the extremes, it's weird. It really yeah. is. It doesn't always... It doesn't click. doesn't always click. It doesn't always make sense. Like, I, I, you know, I had an executive that I trained. I, I can't even say his name because... If I do, people will know who he is because he he's worked uh, like hand in hand with some of the top entrepreneurs of our lifetimes. Okay, so this guy's brilliant. He's got multiple patents. Very smart guy, and he his lifestyle was anything but healthy. Yeah. But when we would try to change it, it would mess him up. When you would do yeah. his presentations and in, in, in his meetings and stuff, mm -hmm. why? I don't know why. I can't explain it. But I also can't explain why this guy can invent and innovate at the at the rate that he did. Um, that didn't make sense to me either. So at that level, things get kind of weird. And I'll say this about genetics. They can be crazy and extreme. Yeah. And it's rare, right? But I've met people yeah, but that a, I would consider in that level that just it just doesn't make sense. Well, that's, a, can do. That's, a, that's another good point, though, right? Because one of the things that uh, I mean, I think uh, I forget the name of the kid who runs the More Plates, More Dates, but he, he the example. Derek. Or, 
Is that yeah, Dad, yeah. that's right. Uh yeah, I shouldn't call him a kid. Sorry, I know he's not a kid. He's a grown ass. Everybody's man. a kid now. <laughs> know, We're getting like, old, dude. Anybody who's one that's, year younger than us <laughs> is a kid. Such a bad yeah. habit. Courtney Courtney I don't me mean that, that in a disrespectful yeah. way whatsoever. Yeah. Whatsoever. But uh oh, what was the point I was making about his comment on the nutrition? Oh, what you just said about like so remember when we talked to uh Ben Pakolsky and yeah. it, it blew my mind about, I know. but that's what came to mind right away because they were talking about, oh, I I doubt it's possible that he could be getting what his body needs in one single meal a day. Well, after listening to Ben talk about what makes these superior, you know, bodybuilders so superior when it comes to dieting and stuff like that, it completely changed the way I look at I it. I tell you what. So, uh, for me, so right now I'm I weigh about I don't know 212 to 215, and if I wanted to bulk and push, by the way, this this is heavy for me. If I wanted to push my body weight to let's say 225, so I want to gain 10 pounds, <clears throat> I would have to eat probably 5,000 calories a day, which would be very hard. I'd have to stuff myself get perfect sleep. And that would bring me up to 225. There's 280 pound bodybuilders that eat 3000 calories a day. Yeah. How? Genetics. There. I used to think, and what you're referring to is a conversation with Pakulski where I said, man, bodybuilders, they've got crazy digestion to be able to eat as much yeah. as they do to get as big as they do. And he goes, no, bro. He goes, they just utilize the nutrients. Yeah. He goes, they, they, they're big because efficacy, they yeah. can eat like a normal amount and build as much muscle. And I mean, I say normal amount, they're still eating more than the average person. <laughs> But you look at a 280 pound ripped. Person yeah, the, ra the ratios are off. Like 35, like you're saying, calories, 4, I, I've calories? been there at, at 5,500 calories and at 230. And like part of what stops me at 230 is that, like, man, I've got to go to six or 7,000 calories if I want to go to 240, 250. Yeah. That's just how it's worked because I don't have those genetics like that. Where So that's what came to mind to me is like everybody's like, oh, there's, I doubt a 260 pound, you know, pro athlete is getting enough calories. Obviously, in one he is. Yeah. I know. Maybe he is actually for his body. Maybe he mm -hmm. only maybe he only needs twenty five hundred calories. Dude, of, some of these guys are crazy. You ever seen Herschel Walker? I was just gonna mention. Were you? Wasn't Hersch Herschel Walker had a weird diet as well? Like once he, a day. He, yeah, once a day he fought. Isn't he the one who popularized the 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 OMAD diet or what? The one. Well, meal he's a day? the guy people would refer to. Herschel Walker, okay. one of the most gifted athletes of all time, in his fifties fought. A champion. In, he fought in MMA in his fifties. I watched him fight. Looked yeah. incredible. He yeah. just now he's running for mayor. Or he just won. Right? He just won a, a, a seat in Congress. Oh, that's you awesome. know, I mean, it just sometimes these people exist. I've met I've met a couple people where I didn't believe them until I watched them. Yeah, and I was like, this is just this is just. I, I I've told this guy the story about this guy before. I'm sure he's heard this story. Literally, pop tarts. And in 99 cents cheeseburgers because he barely had any money. Yeah. And the guy would go out to the gym and do skull crushers. And I'm not making this up. I swear to God. I remember he did. And this is before we had cell phones with, with cameras. I swear I would have filmed it. Skull crushers with 225. Like perfect form. The long barbell. Doing, and I'm looking at him like, <laughs> I quit. I don't want to do this anymore. And he's got abs I'm too, dead. right? Yeah. Just, I mean, ripped. Yeah. You know, just ripped and just, uh, it's just insane. I, I also had a client, talk about genetics. I had a client who had a kid. Now she was a college athlete and her husband was a college athlete. So that he was a soccer player. She, she did, I forgot what she, she was swimming, I think. Okay. So they're both high level athletes and they had this little boy and they brought him in and he was like three and a half. He wasn't even four years old. And to watch this kid swing a bat and catch a baseball and throw at three and a half years old. Yeah. I remember looking at, and I, I wonder, God, I, I should find, I should get in contact with him because I bet you this kid's doing some crazy stuff. But at three and a half years old, he's doing things I couldn't do when I was 15 years old. Uh, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. But those, you know, what, what, what genetics No, there's, there's, all, there's definitely a, a major genetic component. I just don't think people think about that when it comes to nutrition too. Yeah. Like you think about, it, that's an obvious one. It's, like, and it's rare, by the way. Most yeah. people are not like that. <clears throat> Yeah, no, uh, but it's uh, maybe equally rare with with the physical attributes, but we can see that, right? So you can see, like your example, yeah. you're giving everybody's had the the nephew or cousin or kid or brother or yeah, sister yeah. who they were like Jesus at like four, they were yeah. already doing these crazy things, right? So people have seen that, but not a lot of people can can see that. Oh, you don't know what this guy was eating or not. And I know Justin's brought up someone who used to work for us. We had a trainer. I had a trainer who worked for me for years. Jerry, Jerry shout yeah, out to Jerry. Freak, oh, I know he is. Oh yeah, he was yeah. Out, out just. Great. Great guy, man. He looked like he was ready, stage ready, year All round. Time. Yeah. And ate, skipped his first meal, ate Taco Bell for lunch. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. train, yeah. train like moderately Except intense, huge biceps, dude. just <laughs> freaking like what, yeah, dude? all natural. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just gorgeous physique, dude. Just yeah. unreal, yeah. unreal, dude. Wow. So you say gorgeous? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he looked beautiful. Yeah. I'm secure, bro. He was glistening. One <laughs> time he took I'm, a shower. Let me tell you, he looked I'm secure. I can call another man's physique gorgeous. Hey, speaking of this, these kind of genetic stuff. I was funny yesterday. So my son works here uh, now, my my 16-year-old son. And we were out there in the front and, you know, he's helping. He's learning how to edit. So we're out there with the editors and I'm hanging out, eating a little bit. And my son goes, I don't know, we were telling stories. And my son goes, hey, did you tell them the time? No, no, it's my dad, right? That he lifted the the heavy uh, chair, you know, by the bottom uh, leg, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So then he got to confirm, you know, the story. That, and I don't know where those genetics went. Uh, dad, he, he, I mean, maybe my brother has them, but I definitely don't have them. I'd say your brother has them. Maybe because uh, uh, your brother cycles, but yet then he can get in there and lift like. Yeah, yeah that's he, true. Put, yeah, but I mean, puts, he puts what a tenth of the effort in the gym that you do. Maybe oh, like, he's just he's just a strong horse. Yeah, dude. but my dad was uh, like even this. So when we're telling the story, he was in his sixties, and I and I tell he's got arthritis everywhere. He's got pain and stuff. He can't really move very well. And we were hanging out. This was like last year. And my son doesn't believe my stories when I tell him what your grandfather does. <clears throat> so we're all sitting there, and I tell my dad, I said, you know, I tell I tell uh, my son the stories, and he doesn't believe me. And my dad says, oh, yeah? And he goes, do you think I could – he has these old, you know – Wood uh, chairs. Yeah, wooden heavy chairs. He goes, I bet you I could I – could, do you think I could lift it from the bottom leg from the end with my arm straight? And my son's like, no way. My dad goes over, and he freaking does it. My son's face is like – how does he do that? Yeah. Genetics. I have no idea. He's able to summon CNS power that comes from yeah. comes from nowhere. I love Which those I, like yeah. old man superhuman. That's bro. Things. That's years and years of cement mixing right there. Dude. I know, you know dude. But it's and more than that tile too. and stuff. I know, dude. No, I I really. I mean, of course, there's a genetic component, and then there's also what we've talked about is just you know you just train and live that way. Yeah, old man strength is a real thing. I mean, you you've you've been in this body for so many years. Yeah, when you're like you may, 17 and you, you may wrestle lose, your uncle. Yeah, you may you may <laughs> lose, like as you get older, you may lose a lot of the muscle that you had when you were in your 20s. But the CNS actually could continue to improve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that we don't we always assume that you know as you get older, all of a sudden you're just going to get. Super you're also more body aware, right? Because you've been in your body. Uh, yeah, that's all know, part of that, yeah. right? So yeah, no, I think I know that, every guy has that. I think every guy has experienced that where you're like 18, kind of feeling yourself. Ugh, I'm strong. Yeah, I could yeah. beat up my. I could I could take my uncle down with the pop belly over <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, and yeah. then he just kicks your ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> holds you down. Why he's flipping burgers? Yeah. Like yeah. Like this and it like your spine just like hits the back of you. You're like, yeah. Oh, I hate. I used to hate that. Anyway, yeah. so I want to ask you a question adam yeah why don't you look as good as justin and I? <laughs> yeah i was gonna say yeah. you're you're rocking the uh college yeah. shirt I obviously days. Did, I, Vior, viori we work I with viori. Why you, i got I my full did, drip here i obviously did not get the viori memo actually it's just good to see you guys finally bought in completely what do you mean finally <laughs> i wear them all the time <laughs> yeah, it's actually yeah, i've been getting a lot <laughs> of the collar we're repping dude because i'm trying to look more mature you know? I, you're yeah. getting that i see that on the jessica's YouTube. likes mature men apparently so, I, wow. I, i'll just keep getting mature yeah is that what influenced it i had a feeling that's what no i just want you know what it is i where was i it was a while i was at the mall and there was a dude in his 40s and he was kind of fit, right? And he was with his family and he was wearing like jeans and a t-shirt and whatever. And I looked at him like, he kind of looks like a kid. Like he doesn't look as good as he, as he could. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's me. Like I need to, I need to start dressing my age, you know, looking, I need to start looking more mature, you know? So that's, that was what inspired me. So. Yeah. This is where you tip over completely. No went, going back now. No, yeah. I don't even want to start keep my tiny beard nice and sharp. May as well yeah. hike the pants up a little bit more, tuck the shirt in. No, man. You know hey, speak, speaking of which, are those, are those, the, those are like the original Jordans look like that, right? But they weren't that they, color. These are. These are fours, yeah. Jordan Are fours. they? Yeah. Wow. How come you never tie your shoelaces? Because uh, I like to get out of them, in and out of them really easy. Really? Yeah. Somebody was giving me a hard time about that talking shit. I'm not trying to run anywhere. So why? Why? why <laughs> Wait, why? why do you want to get in and out of them? When you, oh, just when you go home? Oh, yeah. When off? I kick them off, you know? Because yeah. I know you're the opposite. Like, you fucking strangle your feet in your yeah. chest. No, 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 no. Yes. I take them off, too. Yes. But I, I, you can't wear these with no well, shoelaces. I double knot, dude. That's you so you I, strangle your How do you shoe, take yeah. your but you But you can't with chucks. You have to tie the shoelaces. I still laces. leave them really loose. I leave them loose so I can just kick them off. With chucks? Yeah. They're so flimsy. The back is so... Yeah, you, yeah, you try do, to slide your foot I, in. I've... I can't remember it's the last. Your feet are really small. Uh, is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> He's got narrow feet. That's not true. No, <laughs> you have smaller feet than I do. No, so. I don't. Same size. Are you? Yeah. You are not. I swear to God. What's uh, I wear a size 12, 12 and a half. What do you wear? No, you don't. 
Bro, I'll, I'll take my shoe off right now and show you. Really? You have 12 shoe, but then you wear a medium shirt? How's that I don't possible? wear a medium shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on a second. You're three inches taller than me. It's all in his feet, have, dude. We have the same size foot, though. That's kind of weird. What does that mean? <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> no. But those are the originals, huh? I these remember are four, Jordan 4s. What is that? There was a one before. There's a one, two, three, and then a four. There's a five and six and seven, eight, oh, nine, okay. ten, eleven, twelve. It goes for, for a while. Yeah. yeah, it goes for a long time. Dude. I don't know about any of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. the uh, I you know I have a, I this is one of my favorite styles. So I have four. I, I distinctly f- remember those. Yeah. Well, when did they first come out? So that would be we would be uh, this was when we were probably let's see here uh, sixth grade or fifth fifth sixth grade. You're a little bit older than me, so you you were maybe a little seventh bit. eighth or something like that. Yeah, that's why I remember yeah. it because yeah. right. that's when kids start right before it. high school. Mm-hmm. Right before high school for you, I was a little bit younger. When did you get your first pair? Because when I was a kid, when so we these were, were kids. so these were actually before me. So I, I my first pair were because the, they were expensive. Yeah, like, like my, grandma, my first pair of expensive shoes. They were a hundred bucks back then. Yeah, they were like one thirty. My grandma bought my first pair. What number was it? Where they were black, and then they had kind of the red. Um, the gum, uh, or, or like the silver tongue, the with red, and then it had like a clip on the front. That so those were my first pair. Those yeah. are the Doug. Will you pull up Jordan Sevens? I think those are the Jordan the Sevens. Sevens. I believe yeah. those are the Sevens. Because that was my... I, those I were my first pair. They were black and gray yeah. and with the the insert, the, like the real smooth insert, and then had the little, the little yep. drawstring tie on it. Mm. Those are my first pair. I was in fourth or fifth grade, and I had them for maybe a few days. My grandmother bought them for me, and I played mud football in them. Right. Wow. <laughs> Just some dumb... Wow. Sh- yes, yeah. they're the Sevens, right, Justin? Oh, I remember those. Those ones? Yeah. Wait, yep. wait. Click on those, Doug. The, this, that pair right there is my very first pair. Uh, oh, I remember those too. Yeah. So these are four. So these no, are mud those mine. football. Well, bro, I was a kid. Jordans? I was a dumb kid. I, I was like, really you know, uh, you don't know any better at that age. Wow. Yeah. And then what did you do when you came home? Just like cried? No, I just like a dumb kid. I just, they fucking, they had mud all in. I was so into what we were doing that I wasn't thinking about my shoes, you know? Yeah. I mean, at that, I don't know. It's I like, was never into uh, really expensive uh, like sneakers or tennis shoes ever yeah. never never i got one pair a year and it was normally my grandmother my That's, grandma my grandmother would like take me, me shopping and that was the, f- the first and last year i ever ruined them right so i ruined them like that and then in- anything going for that was like my first i think i got a, my I got my ass chewed for that and then after that anytime i had a i got one nice pair for the school year mm-hmm. and i like took care of them and i only wore them and then as i got older I, that still stayed I got one nice pair a year and they were like I my, had, my court shoes. I yeah. had developed a relationship. I, you know, I take that back. I never bought into like the expensive, like you know, shoes that everybody had. But I did develop this this relationship with indoor soccer shoes. And here's why. So you guys know I used to wear sambas? like sambas <laughs> yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, here's why. I bought a pair once, and then uh, I was some girl complimented. No, him. no, oh. no, no. You would think, right? No, we were playing flag football or something, and I was like, felt super fast, and I was like, that's it, dude. These are the shoes, and they wore <laughs> so <laughs> fast. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be the shoes, dude. Light so fast. Speaking of you know of uh, uh, you know superstitions and rituals, that was mine. <laughs> Put on my indoor soccer <laughs> shoes so I can go fast. You know, yeah, yeah. I, I would pick like my favorite athlete, obviously like Michael Jordan at the time, but then it was Bo Jackson, so I got Bo Jacksons, oh. and then like Larry Johnson. I think he had like these black top. Converse that I would wear because I played a lot of uh, basketball, just pickup games and stuff. That I followed a lot of basketball when I was a kid. Wow. Yeah, that's all I wore: yeah. pennies, Iversons, oh, like, yeah, Jordans. Iversons. Like that's I. But yeah. my first pair of Jordans weren't until the sevens, so these came later. I actually didn't get introduced to the actually wearing a pair of fours till actually way later. It wasn't that long ago? That wasn't that long ago when I think somebody else told me like, "Oh man, my fours are my favorite." And I'm like, I've actually I never. I, as I got older and I would go back and buy Jordans again, mm-hmm. I only bought Jordans that I wore because I wore them. I remember wearing them and liking them. Oh, and, yeah. You had the sentimental value. Right. That part of it. And so I never went back to a, like the ones, the two. So I have my first pair of ones not that long ago. I've, and then I have several fours now. You know what shoes I remember a lot in junior high and high school? Uh, Cortez. Remember those? Yeah. yeah. You know why? Those are popular again. Yeah, they are. Do you know yeah. why? Because you were- The eggshell uh, front? They were gangster no, shoes. No, okay, hold kid. on a second. Yeah. This was what was weird about they them. They were gangster shoes when we were kids. You were, were either, shoes. you were either a gangster <clears throat> or, they were red. or a skater. Yeah. You were, it was weird. It was like these two groups or that you had- you were a gangster skater. Yeah. Like <laughs> you, were, you were not a gangster <laughs> not a skater. Gangster. You were just- <laughs> Were you a skater? <laughs> no. I was a, I was a mountain cholo, I dude. know, I know. Yeah, I kind of, the, the cross of the flannel and the- um, yeah, you had chino, you had pants, and, oh yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, Ben Davis <laughs> and all that, that, dude. I was you wore the Bens too, huh? Yeah, Ben Davis and the Dickies and yeah, dude, that was my thing. I wow, was, I was definitely Good that deal. guy. Hey, you guys want to hear a crappy study? Yeah, <laughs> crappy. Yeah, I just read this really sad study. It made me annoyed. <clears throat> Uh, scientists have connected um, microplastics to irritable bowel syndrome. So, you know, irritable bowel disease and syndrome and gut issues are just continuing to rise. Like more and more people Dude. developing issues with their digestion of their gut. And uh, scientists in China have connected uh, microplastics in people's gut and in their system to, you know, having digestive issues. Where do you get these microplastics from? Well, everywhere. He, everywhere. Well, here's a one. Everything. Here's yeah. one big way: hmm. drinking water out of plastic, out of out of uh, plastic bottles. So oh, when you God. you buy water yeah. in a plastic bottle, the, the 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 manufacturing and processing of that where they put the cap on and everything, microplastics get in the water. So when you drink that, so you get your bottle of water and you're like, oh, this is cool. Also, when the sun hits it, it leaches in too, right? Yeah, but we're talking right. That's something else, right? Those oh. are the, those are the, those are the chemicals. Whatever, this is right? actual. Small, tiny, microscopic fragments of plastic, dude. Like plastic I hope that dust. scares Katrina from buying it. It's been like a at-home little argument that we've been in for plastic a while. Bo water bottles. She just loves the convenience of them for using them in the house all the time, and it drives me crazy because I'm like, dude. First of all, we we were invested in a water company that we could use, like yeah, and they use aluminum, yeah, and then they and it's refillable, so it's not that expensive for us to get like one of those filters put in the house. I told her already, like I'll get it, I'll do it. And I said, I'll fill up all the water and do it. But she just, she likes having the, we have the small ones, we have the tall ones. They're always going through my house. And I'm like, oh my God. She's like, when did you become this guy? Mr. Drive your big old lifted truck. And like, I'm like, oh God, here we oh, go. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> throw it in my face like that. He's too fucking, <laughs> you yeah. Yeah, all crunchy. Yeah, yeah throttle out, and your V8s <laughs> around all over the place and burning gas like crazy. You, you know what? Though, time, you like, know what oh, though? God, what plastic is everywhere. But what you're saying makes sense because you also save money. So you save money if you right. have a filter and you have refillable bottles that are made out of either right. aluminum or glass. I like glass. Uh, it's really good too, except obviously you could break it. Um, and then you, you, I don't know about you guys, but when you take out your recycling. So I used to buy water bottles all the time. I'd go to Costco and get like a huge pack of, yeah. of and then I'd go in my recycling, take the garbage out. And it's just so many plastic bottles. I remember like, oh, this is kind of weird. That's how I feel. Especially considering we grew up. I swear to God, in this drinking in the, out of the hose in the eighties, yeah. if you had told somebody, "Oh, huge market, people are going to buy water," people would say, "Yeah, they'd laugh you out of the building." We're going to buy air. What next? else do you think is going to be like that? Right? Do you ever think about? I, I always think about stuff like that. Things that we would have never thought, like that we would be paying like significant. Maybe we'll start selling dirt. Yeah, like they do sell from, dirt. Well, I mean, yeah, like from exotic place, it's exotic dirt. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> I think air. Well, you know, like you, you ever have you ever tried to buy like a you ever, to get like a rock with moss on it? It's hell expensive. Oh yeah, yeah. Like oh, if, I, I got a story. Did I tell you guys? Yeah, about you didn't know that. If no. you want, if you want a rock that has like moss growing on it, some of that, those rocks are hell expensive. Yeah, or you can go to the woods and try and find it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. Did I tell you guys? I, I don't know if I told you guys a story about when Jessica she got into rock painting. She'll get like smooth rocks, and she's really artistic. Does a really good job. Yeah, she drew them up at the Truckee house. She did really yeah. under still there, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember she, I would come home. This is when she was pregnant with my my youngest. <clears throat> and she, you know, she would have done one or two of them, and it was really peaceful for her, or whatever. And I was like, wow, these are really nice. I'm like. Where are you getting these rocks from? She's like, oh, you just go outside. I go for walks, you know, in front of people's yards. Like, Steal them from uh, the neighbor. <laughs> I'm like, honey, I'm like, you're mm -hmm. stealing people's rocks. And she goes, no, it's not. It's rocks. It's nature. I said, hold on a second. I said, do you think that those are just natural rocks that we, <laughs> that we have laying around everywhere? And she's like, oh, shit. I didn't even think of that. And I'm like, yeah, dude, you're stealing Plugging rocks. it from the neighbor's yard. Yeah. <laughs> and like, I don't know why we get to keep re refilling yeah. our rocks here. People get their, their yards fucked up because <laughs> she's taking their rocks. There's a pretty no more path left. Yeah. Well, speaking of like waste and stuff like that. So um, one of our sponsors, Public Goods, one of the things I like that they do, and I just got this, right? I just got an order for dish soap. When you first buy a product from them, they'll give you like the main container. Yeah. So like shampoo or soap or cleaner or whatever. And it comes in like what you would normally expect, a plastic bottle that you would get at the grocery store, except uh, public goods also takes another step and try to get rid of certain plastics and chemicals, whatever. But nonetheless, normal bottle. Then when you go to reorder, it's less expensive and they send you a, a, reef, a bag 
that is less plastic, less waste right. to refill. And it's, and it's one third the price, right? And so, it's less. Yeah. So it's so like, so it's like you want to refill your shampoo or your or your hand soap. You don't get another yeah, one of those way bottles. More sense than having to just get a container every single time. I think everywhere should do this. I know. Imagine if you go to the grocery store. It's like a duh. Yeah, you get your original product, but then when you go back, you get your refillable bags, which is way less waste, better for the environment. Um, probably cost less because they don't need to put it in the same. Yeah, that's of- an interesting thought. I, you know, I don't know why. Like, I, obviously, they're direct to consumer, so it, it's a it's a smart model for yeah. them and an easy model for them to do. I wonder if it, it what kind of challenges are presented it to do that, like in Costco, for example, like your example. I think it's all about consumer education because yeah. a consumer would be maybe would think like, what's the difference between you know what I mean? Maybe that's what it is. But I, I think it's the way of the future for sure. Like, well, I feel like if they if they price structure it the same way that public goods does, right? So if you looked at a public goods shampoo bottle, I don't know what Doug had it up a minute ago, like how many ounces it is, but it's like I don't know six or seven ounces for the the little shampoo bottle or whatever that they it's have. Twelve ounces. There's twelve bottle. ounces. Okay, mm-hmm. so it's twelve ounces for the shampoo bottle. At, are you pulling it up for me? It's not okay. okay yeah, you're right there, right there. Mm-hmm. So twelve ounces, it's seven bucks, right? For basically twelve ounces, six ninety five. Twelve yeah. ounces, but then it's for thirty four ounces of refillable, it's fourteen ninety five. And it's so, in a, it's in this bag with minimal yeah. <clears throat> packaging, and you know, so, so you're getting you're almost three, three times, right, for right. double the price. So I guess if if Costco had a thing where all these other brands, mm-hmm. competitors, and so with that, had you had like the bottled price, and then you had all the refills next to it, and then you saw the ounces and mm-hmm. so then you could then you could educate that way that'd be the you'd have to do that yeah because otherwise it, people would be like oh yeah. i don't get this that's one. what i mean you'd i think have to you, display it right next to each yeah. other and like yeah be able to really <laughs> highlight this <laughs> is where you go come back to get to, to refill yeah it. because i think a big we, we could definitely make a difference with uh changing consumers behaviors but just through education right like have you guys how many times have you got a product from amazon and it's a product this big and it's in a freaking plastic box this big and another box this big. And you're like, why, yeah. Yeah. why do I have all this packaging for the small item? And I know why it's because it, it sells better or yeah. stacks better, or whatever, or it's consumers are, are more likely to buy something that's individually packaged. Well, like, it feels more valuable when it's bigger or it has more weight to it, you know? And so I think a lot of times companies like put emphasis on that and oh, the packaging. I've seen apples sold individually wrapped. A freaking apple like, individually why? wrapped with plastic around it. Yeah. And it's because consumers, I think, need to change kind of their behaviors. So this, to me, I feel like is the future where you buy a product, you get your original container, and then you just reuse that container. More and more companies are going this direction. You just don't see it that common anymore mm-hmm. on the on the store brands, right? Mm-hmm. But you definitely see more direct consumer brands are are going this direction. Yeah, that's they've cool. been great. I've like I've converted like my whole house, mm. and they have because they have everything, dude. Everything from dryer sheets to laundry, shampoo, de- deodorant, toothpaste, uh, soap, hand soap, like dishwasher yeah. soap, like. All of it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. and I, and I like the way it looks. Yeah. You know, I know that doesn't matter as much to a lot of people, but I mean, it's it's a cool, clean look for like a brand, and so it matches everything. That so, happens. I wanted to ask you, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want. Um, <coughs> but uh, well, I'm asking you about. So, yeah. with that, I don't want to push people this direction yet because we are going to have uh, an interview at some point where we interview an expert about this. But we've experimented a little bit with peptides from uh-huh. the uh-huh. hormone uh, facility that we work with. And peptides are a very interesting class of, I don't know if you call them drugs or, you know, supplements, how, what category they are, but they're very interesting. And I've used ibutamorin, which is this, uh, it's like, it's called a secretagogue. It makes your body release more growth hormone when you take it orally. And I've noticed some very interesting results, actually kind of a, a muscle building mass builder. And again, I'm not going to make recommendations because these are all prescribed by the doctors in this this thing. But there was a peptide also that is for libido in in men and women. Literally, it's a it's a peptide that you use, and I believe you use it. There's two ways you can use it. I know you can inject it sub Q, like a small insulin needle, or I think you can do it with a nasal spray, if I'm not mistaken. And it it's a it's a libido booster in men and in women. And so I know you've messed with it a little bit. Yeah, I'm I on, experimented with it. I'm on my second time. So Katrina, I got Katrina to do it one time, which was really hard to get her to do that. She was like, what are you injecting in me? <laughs> <laughs> Just trust me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God yeah, we're you there. better not abuse that yeah, power. Yeah, I know, know, I know. So I, uh, it's so, a horny, it's a horny peptide, baby. Yeah, 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 I tell yeah. her afterwards. You'll yeah. like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, I'm only on the second time of using it. So, and I was just tell, off air. I was talking to you that, like, first of all, I, I never like to judge anything that I'm trying like this uh, off of just a couple uses. Yeah. 
Um, the first one, I, I felt like I, I didn't really notice much. So I took, like, you, you told me the, like, you know, mild amount to take. Yes. So I obviously started with that. I didn't really notice anything. The second one, I took the, the higher dose. I definitely, I felt that, right? Um, and what I guess we're going to get fucking really personal here. Felt mm. it in my erection more than I felt anything else. Wow. Like, so I, I said, you said it's supposed to increase <laughs> libido. Um, I didn't know if I if I saw it like increase my sex drive as much as I felt the the difference in the erection. That's where I felt mm, the difference. Mm -hmm. So she ha she's only tried it one time, um, and she didn't give me any feedback of noticing. Anything. Although the next morning she said she felt that way. So I don't know what the the half life is on it. If it's supposed to last that long or not, it can last up to seventy two hours. Oh, it can. Yeah. So okay. I so I I messed with it a little bit. And it's called PT141. I had to look it up. So again, I'm not advocating for it yet because we, we're not the people that would prescribe this or talk to you about it. But just we've been experimenting before we do this interview coming up. But I noticed, so I got some flushing. So I did it. And like within 10 minutes, I got flushing in my, like my neck and my skin. And then maybe two hours or three hours later, I could tell some libido boost. And that lasted for like two days. Oh, interesting. So for like two days, I was a little bit. So I also have the uh, ibutamorin. You yeah, say? you're doing that one too, right? I haven't started that yet. And so, I, only because I, I this I've been I haven't trained all week, so I, I'm like still got. This You'll notice with your sleep. Oh, really? Yeah. So you take it before bed, and you get oh, really I take it. vivid, like dreams, because it, it increases REM the the stage of, of dreaming, REM stage. So I wonder if me smoking weed will cancel that, even though I haven't smoked weed in over a week. Either. I don't think so. Hmm. I don't think so. But hmm. really interesting stuff. There's a whole class of these compounds in this kind of category of peptides. So we'll have a we'll have a doctor on. Yeah, I don't feel comfortable selling it to anybody yet. I just uh, personally, I'm a little crazy when it comes to trying stuff like that. I'm, well, not, I'm not afraid to do stuff. But you I'll, could go on our forum, which is is it MP Hormones? Uh, what's the forum I called? Think, uh, Mind Pump Hormones. Mind Pump Hormones. It's a free forum on Facebook, and you can ask questions uh, and and have you know doctors answer, or they do live question and answer once a week on there, um, and kind of find out. Yeah, you I'm know, not qualified. Or I'll just you, tell you my experience. Nah, same here. Or you could go to mphormones.com, <laughs> and then you, they'll they'll do an assessment, and then you can ask them questions or whatever. And your hormones could be normal for peptides. It's not like if you have low testosterone. It's not, Interesting though. Well, since this whole category is so fascinating. Well, since you're talking about hormones and uh, peptides, and I have more steroid talk then. So, uh, I, I would when I was on Derek's page, the more plates, more dates, and I was looking at the DK Metcalf. I was kind of going down the rabbit hole of like his latest post. Um, and I guess there is this uh, a trend going on right now. No pun intended. Of trend p sniffing. Trend what? trends. Yeah. What is this weird? So trend, trend. You mean trembolone? Yes. The the anabolic steroid that's yes. uh, never approved for human use. So there, yeah. You showed me the video, and the guy's like sniffing it before he's gonna do a rep of like rose. So yeah, the and, smell and, and, and claiming the aroma or the smells or potentially maybe the chemicals that are uh, you know the chemical aroma that's coming that off of it. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. That's but, weird. Yeah, I don't. I, it, and but it's supposedly like this trend that's happening right now that people all over are are doing this. Have, have, you guys haven't seen this yet. No. Okay. No, yeah. that's so weird. It, this is it, some weird like. Um, is it possible? Is it even possible? Well, I mean, what was I that mean, one you study? literally just you just talked about a supplement that we could inject inject potentially, or you could do a nasal spray. Well, yes, but I don't think you're. I think you're inhaling. I don't think you're inhaling like chemicals. I think it's just a smell. But may, maybe I'm wrong. I know. Well, look. Here's the deal. There's studies that show people will rinse out, rinse their mouth with like a sweet telling, a sweet tasting form. Uh, uh, you know, drink, spit it out, and have improved performance. Have you seen those studies? They don't even yeah. swallow it. They yeah. just taste it, spit it out, and then they have improved performance. So it's just like, yeah, it's the smell that sort of triggers the... So they, they'd have to be familiar with it before, right? Like, have to be That's what injecting, I would think. yeah, like steroids to get some kind of associative what? like oh, benefit you think, from Oh, you it. think like that, huh? Yeah, I, like, I would what, think what so. Would, what would like a trend bottle do to your average person who's never taken steroids? That's true. That's true. Nothing. Although I will say this, th there are some weird things that smells do cause in people like pheromones uh, make people behave in very strange ways. And Yeah. But I don't know about that. True. Yeah, that's very interesting. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's weird. Like who started this trend? Like, it, like it's so weird to me. Bodybuilders will do anything. I tell <laughs> yeah, you what though, will. that particular, so it's an illegal steroid, never prescribed for human use it was developed for cattle so i didn't like it, to, it they would give it to cows to bulk them up or whatever and it's 500 times more anabolic and androgenic 
than testosterone. That's why this people, is the one you hear in Jersey Shore all the time, right? Like, I mean, all yeah, over D-ball. bodybuilding forums. No, D-ball people, is different. People D-ball love D-ball. D-ball was prescribed to yeah, humans, yeah. or designed for humans. This is a this, this is was for cattle. Pure and <laughs> and if you read, this is the one that's associated. I mean, that's with not a fair mental com- effect. That's not a fair complete knock though, because I I mean, one of my favorite hormones I ever took was Equipoise. True. And Equipoise was made for chickens. And no, stuff. no, no. Originally though, it was a, uh, a an anabolic for humans, and then it went to vet. Oh, that's true. Trembolone Trembolone's never Never been. I didn't know that about Equipoise. Yeah. I didn't know yeah, that. I think in 1960 something, uh, Boldenone is the chemical name. Yeah, so, yeah. Boulderon. Well, right. Boldenone. Oh, I thought it was Boulderon. Yeah, maybe Doug, look up, uh, type in Boldenone, just like it sounds, and see if uh, you know, when that <laughs> Not with out. the R that yeah. Adam wants to put yeah. in it. I think, I think <laughs> you took a supplement yeah. called Boulderone. Hey, hey, no, yeah, I was going to say, maybe <laughs> my them shit shoulder boulders, dude. <laughs> no, bro, I'm sure it was Boulderon. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you probably weren't taking the real shit, Adam. Yeah. Fuck. No, but uh, I mean, yeah, sounds there cool. it is. Uh, can, maybe you can see when it first uh, was used or first created. Um, I did not. I always thought it was a an uh, animal steroid. Animal. It is, but um, uh, but originally, I believe, but my point of, I guess, well, I guess you 1949. Wow, wow. 1950s and 60s. Uh, there, it looks like there. Well, was it what was it used for originally? Humans. I know, but oh, what, oh, what, 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 what? Oh, I think what, it was for um, anemia. They were typically for anemia and for, you know, some of these anabolics were designed for breast cancer. Oh, really? What? Stero- yes. Anabolic steroids. Some of them were designed for women to stop breast cancer. Hmm. This is before we had, um, you know, like Nolvidex and these, what are called selective estrogen receptor modulators. Yeah. Um, Masteron is one that was designed for women. It's a it's an anabolic steroid based off of the hormone DHT, but what it does is it makes the activity of estrogen greatly reduced. And so they knew that for women, if they were had like a, a estrogen sensitive a, a estrogen cancer, mm. that if they use this, so they were giving women anabolic steroids wow. to fight to fight cancer. I so. never knew this. I didn't know it goes all the way back yeah. like that. But I didn't like trend though. I had too many side effects. Well I read that the the psychological that's the one that's mostly associated with psychological effects where people actually go there you get the roid rage. Paran- no paranoia, okay. anxiety, like a bunch of weird stuff. Hmm. I don't know, man. I mean, that's the one that I, I got the, the what they call a trend cough from it. I got the I got the freaking uh, acne really bad from it. Wow. Like it it flared up the, the gynecomastia. Like I had all bad stuff. Weird. Side. Yeah, trend this was, was back when you were competing, obviously. Uh, before actually, mm-hmm. I didn't mess with that stuff during com- 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 By the time I got into competing, I already you were smart. I went through the gamut of dumb steroid stuff. Like I, that's the the irony of anybody who's paid attention or seen like maybe old mm-hmm. pictures of my transformation all that stuff i was taking less steroids uh when i was a, a com- competing at the professional level than i did was a 22 year old 23 year old kid when i was a kid like i, I knew no- you know i've heard that so many times from people who compete that they that th- there's a way to use them and of course diet and training and sleep play a huge role still Whereas when people are younger, they think, "Oh, I'm just going to the more take a bunch of more." Stuff. Yeah, when you're younger, or 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 it doesn't necessarily have to be young. When you're first getting introduced to it, you just assume that more is better, or try this for cutting, try this for bulking, stack this with that for these benefits. Yeah. You hear all the stuff on forums. I had some bodybuilder guy back then that was giving you're me just advice. To sell you a bunch of stuff. Probably. Yeah, he's, he's making money off of me. He made a. I mean, my first stack was like a thousand dollar stack when I was like 23 years old. Wow. So I, I I really messed up early on, and obviously this is what's you know caused me to have to be on freaking replacement therapy today. But I had figured that all out the hard way all through my twenties. When I got into thirty, that's when I started to get into competing. And so when I got into competing, I the first the very first. So if you ever seen my you've seen my video on YouTube and the the before picture where I'm yeah. all fat and I'm like turning around and everything like that. I'm on replacement therapy right there. Oh wow! I don't change my dose. For the first year at all, so I'm. It's all diet and training. Yeah, it's yeah. all diet and training. It sucks that the if people ask me, I'm like, yeah, I'm on testosterone. And then, the, then the, right away, I lose credit for it. It's like, well, that fat guy was on the same amount yeah. of testosterone. It's just I changed the diet. Now it wasn't until I got towards the getting into uh, like on stage mm-hmm. and then getting ready for the next show. So my first show, I went into using my therapy dose. It wasn't until after that that I start to kick up the dose. But even when I was at the absolute peak at the pro level when I could, cause I couldn't put size on I mean, at the amateur level. I was going to the amateur level with my therapeutic dose being told I was too big. Oh, wow. So, and I messed up by the second show. I thought, Oh, let me try and take a little bit more. And that was like, too I got, big. yeah, I, I was like a third or fourth place, my first show. And then I decided to take more 
And my second show, I placed worse because I was too big. And that was the, wow. the feedback the judges get. So I have had to you pull guys, back. Have you guys seen, I got to pull her up because I sent this to my cousins the other day. Have you guys seen, there's this Russian bodybuilder, this female Russian bodybuilder that is, she's bigger than many male pro physique competitors and bodybuilders. I got to find this, this girl because really? I got to find her name because I want people, this, this, it's the craziest like I've never seen anybody look this jacked in my entire. It's a it's a woman, and she looks ridiculous, like jacked to the limits. I got to find her name. I'll, I'll end up finding her. But anyway. while you're looking it up, which one of you guys read the uh, thing that Jackie sent over about the crabs? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the the robot crab. Briefly read about it. It's like yeah, it was oh. these these totally um, are like they nanobots. Like micro, yeah, basically like nanobots. Is that the yeah. idea? Yeah, that they're. I mean, there's there's a lot of science moving in that direction, trying to get uh, these intelligent little bots to to fix uh, cells and identify cancerous cells and just go through your body and, and work body on you and, and stuff. And, and yeah, just like look look for foreign invaders and it's it's totally sci-fi. Yeah. Like it's happening in real time. Uh -oh. what, what I still can't wrap my brain around. Bill Gates listening right now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> what I can't Send wrap my crabs. brain around is the, is how those little things are something that small is made. Uh, with little tiny yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> tell us tiny beard <laughs> <laughs> little pinchers yeah dude it's wild yeah, when you see them lasers they're, they're yeah. so small and they can get them to walk and move and yeah it's like things. crazy yeah nanotechnology is really real doug i texted yeah, I you a link of that russian female bodybuilder he also i want you guys to look at her because himself. i've seen female bodybuilders before but i've never seen one this big really let me see. okay bro this is like this doesn't. This is like a. She'd be big she for still a male pro. Does she look female still? I mean, yeah. I mean, kinda. Okay, there's a picture of her oh, right wow. there, dude. Wow. If you go through her her page, Doug. What's her name? Natalia. Amazonka. Amazonka. Amazon, I guess. I don't Doug, know that's there's the some, there's some pictures on her page where she's like standing next to like yeah, bodybuilders, like, guys. I want to see a different. And picture. she's bigger than they are. Holy Whoa, crap! Yeah, dude. Look at the size of her. Like her arms. Look at her legs right there. Yeah. Now, I know, obviously, she's on drugs, but you even think? if she wasn't, she'd be <laughs> bigger than I am. Well, probably. I think that's what I think people don't understand is that, like, yeah, obviously, like, right away, everybody wants to go, like, oh, so much steroids. It's like, no, there's a massive genetic component to this girl, too. Oh, yeah. Like, that's extreme. It'd be cool to look up, see if you could find her name, and see if you could find her before pre yeah, her pre steroids. I bet she was already like super super thick yeah. and jacked. Pretty crazy. I've I've never met. I mean, I met some women that were had some crazy genetics. Uh, actually, I take that back. I did meet one. I had a trainer once that was she 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 would lift the weights once a week and ran all the time. I had, so I had a girlfriend like that. I had a girlfriend like that. I've told you she when she competed, she had to stop training her legs for the the whole prep for the show because they were just too muscular mm. go and she was bikini so there's like your her, her legs yeah, that's pretty rare so dude. dominant that's super crazy. rare especially in a female right yeah yeah crazy wow hey real quick lmnt is offering a free sample pack with any order okay this is the hookup we have for you right now well what is lmnt this is electrolyte powder no artificial sweeteners and it has the appropriate levels of sodium. I love it because I get better pumps and better performance. It's especially valuable for those of you that are on low-carb diets or don't eat a lot of processed foods and you work out a lot. You need way more sodium than you think, and this is a great way to do it. My favorite flavor is watermelon. But again, you can get a free eight single-serving uh, packets free with any LMNT order. Here's what you got to do. Go to uh, drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Taylor Lauren F. How much protein is too much protein? Oh, yeah. You know, this is a tough one to answer because it really, it's a lot. I hate 395 grams. Mm. Exactly. No, I, I really hate <laughs> the fact that I have to say this so often, but it really does depend on. Do you uh, clear the rooms? Uh, with your gas, that would be an indicator. Yeah, actually, that yes, dude. That's, well, poor the, digestion. Yeah. You know, um, you know, there's there's been myths in the past about eating too much protein, bad for your kidneys, this and that. Not, none of that's true. Um, we tolerate protein very well, generally speaking. But on an individual level, I've worked with clients where, you know, more than you know ninety grams of protein, they just didn't digest very well, and that was okay, and they felt better lower protein. Then I've worked with clients who very high protein diets uh, did very well. Now, of course, you need to make sure you get essential nutrients in your diet. So 
if you eat just protein and you never have enough essential fats, you actually starve your body. Um, in fact, there's a, a syndrome where hunters uh, in the West would actually starve because all they would hunt would be rabbits during a particular season. They would They're actually- so lean. They, would, they wouldn't get enough fat. There's yeah. a great alone episode like that. Oh, that's right. Where he gets the, the yeah, I think I think he's in a I think they're in Alaska at that I time. Saw that. And there's like tons of rabbits, and he's got like rabbits galore. But then he still like like looks like he's totally malnourished. Yeah, yeah, malnourished. I think they call it rabbit starvation or something like that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, how much is too much protein? This really depends on the person. Um, it, it, I would gauge it by digestion mainly. Energy, probably second. Um, and then just quality of life, just general quality of life. I know that we say, and the studies do show, that about 0.6 to 1 gram of protein per pound of body weight is ideal for muscle building and for satiety and fat loss. But if that's too much for you, so long as you get your essential protein, then you're okay. You got you got to eat in a way that makes you feel the healthiest. Now, what is it? I mean, I know initially there was a bit of alarmist kind of fear mongering around mTOR and like yeah. cancer and yeah. all that. Is there any kind of like clarity with that now? You know, it, what's interesting about that is context matters a lot. Okay, so in a cancer environment, okay, when you do have cancer, uh, you can feed that cancer with carbohydrates and with amino acids. Does that mean carbohydrates and amino acids, proteins, cause cancer? No. So mTOR is a mammalian target rapamycin, I think it's called, is a, is a driver of muscle growth or one of the drivers of muscle growth, but it, it causes cells to, to grow. If you have tons of mTOR in a cancer environment, theoretically, it could cause the cancer to grow. Just like if you're in a cancer environment and you've got cancer in your body and then you eat in a bulk, mm -hmm. you can also feed the cancer and it'll grow. Just like fasting has been shown to be anti-cancer. So- uh, no, it doesn't cause cancer. The context matters dramatically. Right. So if, if okay. you're, you know, if you just got a diagnosis for cancer, you, you probably, you want, and it depends on the type of cancer. It's very complex, but you're probably going to want to reduce overall calories. But again, it depends on the individual. You're going to want to look at maybe reducing carbohydrates and, and eating essential protein, but not too much over that. But it depends. It really does depend. It is funny because it, it's so about digest, digestion and, and what you can assimilate. And I know like, I used to get a lot of grief from even my parents because all I wanted to eat was meat growing up. And I, I, I really, nothing else like satisfied me, like just, uh, you know, meat. And, um, I, it's one of those things I hear all the time from, um, different camps about uh, too much protein is going to be at a, a cancer risk, or it's going to be mm -hmm. detrimental towards your gain. If you tip over a certain amount. And I'm just like, I've never really seen that uh, play out in terms of like with my clients. Well, this is a, a, an interesting conversation to have because I think the way I present it would really depend on who, who's sitting across the table from me, because I really feel like most people live in the, the, the ends of the spectrum on, on the protein intake, right? Like I, most of my career uh, training average people, I would say that most all clients that I had uh, under consumed protein, they didn't get adequate protein. They in just simply increasing their protein intake. Um, I saw huge gains mm -hmm. in yeah. uh, them building muscle and their metabolism speeding up and them feeling healthier and better and being more satiated from their meals. Yeah. Like, so I saw huge benefits from increasing it. Then I get later on in my life, um, I, I get more uh, surrounded by the you know, bodybuilding community because I move into that space. Then I'm on the other end of the spectrum where everybody thinks that protein is this magical nutrient that yeah. you can never get too much of it. And you've got guys eating three, 400 grams of protein every single day. And then to your point, Justin, stinking up the place because they're just, their right. body is having a hard time digesting all that and they're just farting and farting yeah. and farting. It's disgusting. Yeah. So it, it really depends on who is sitting across from me and what their 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 typical diet looks like on how what direction I'm going to push them because- So individualized. Yeah. And, and I think too, like even the quality of it matters a lot. Like yeah. Because of that fact that you're not digesting it well, there's probably something that- you know, and there's certain like, especially if you're intaking it a lot from like whey protein or like, I've noticed even with myself, like different, um, different brands out there, like I'll take a whey protein and it'll have a completely different effect in terms of my digestion. I'll have like a lot of gas versus like none, like it's nice and easily digestible. Um, but yeah, that, that 
for sure wasn't something I really considered before. I just thought like, you know, like taking a shake, like it's going to end up, uh, you're going to end up this big cloud of gas. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's because I trained, you know, obviously we train so many people. You see people that are so different. Like I, I would have, I had clients, and I'm like this, where I could eat a large protein meal and feel fine. Like no bloat, feel totally <clears throat> fine, not drowsy, not feel lethargic. I could eat a large carbohydrate meal and it can make me feel bloated. It can make me feel tired. I've had clients the same. And then I've had clients on the other end where they're like, oh, yeah, if I eat a big steak, I need to go take a nap and I just feel bogged down. But if I eat a lot of vegetables and rice and then I feel really light and I feel good. So this is a very individual question. I, I think it also matters too what you do consistently. And it's it like, are we measuring this like a one off day? Like, for example, um, you know, I know that where I like, I'd like to, I like to be at like a one, to, one to one, right? One, one gram to one pound of body weight. So mm -hmm. if I weigh 225, I mm -hmm. want somewhere between 200 to 225 grams of protein. Sometimes I fall a little under that. Sometimes I go over that. Like sometimes I, and I just kind of pay attention to that, especially when I'm tracking and trying to make moves. And I go, oh, today I ended up, man, I just had a lot of meat, right? And, and yeah. ended up being 300 grams of protein. I don't freak out. Just the next day, I'm not as concerned to hitting my 225. So, you know, being aware of that, and I think what you do consistently, where I, I again, going back to the extremes, uh, where I see a problem is the people that uh, grossly underconsume consistently, you know, because here's another thing, 50 grams of protein just one day isn't also going to hurt you either. No. If you only had one day of 50 grams of protein, and then you go back to your normal hitting your targets, not bad at all. In fact, no. there's probably some benefits to that. Sure. Um, so knowing what you do consistently and where, where you fall, I think is important. And then trying to adjust accordingly. And I think if you're falling in that kind of one-to-one -one range is that's why I like that. It's just easy. I know mm -hmm. 0.6 to 0.8 is what all the research says, mm -hmm. but it's really you know, how many clients are going to get their calculator out and try and figure that out. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty safe bet to say, Hey, you weigh this much. If you're relatively fit, you don't have to be super fit, but relatively fit. Uh, here's a good target for you to be, give or take a few grams to this point. And, and if you have a really low day, one day ain't a big deal. If you have a really high day, one day, not a big deal. So long as you're kind of hovering around that, right? Next question is from Daniel Rate. Does gaining strength boost your metabolism or does that happen only when gaining mass? All right. I like this because, because whenever we talk about boosting the metabolism through strength training, I always get messages from people who go, Oh, but studies show that a pound of pro a pound a pound of muscle only burns an extra ten calories a day, or I hate that. whatever. Okay, it's not that simple. You have we have a range of calories that we burn with our current lean body mass. In other words, without gaining or losing any lean body mass, your body could burn as little as this many calories or as much as this many calories. And there's a range. So now, what determines that range? Calorie efficiency or metabolism efficiency. Your body deciding, I need to be more efficient or less efficient with calories. So, for example, if you bulk, if I go and I eat a high calorie day today, I will get a boost in metabolism, a real small boost in metabolism, even if I don't gain any weight yet or anything. If I cut my calories, even if I don't lose any weight yet, we'll get a slow, we'll get a little bit of a metabolic adaptation. Now, the extra muscle mass does burn more calories. But so does the letting your body know it doesn't need to be as efficient with calories. How do we do that? <clears throat> Tell your body to get stronger and feed your body appropriately because both of those require more energy or sorry, the, the getting stronger requires more energy. It tells the body we need more muscle. If you don't build the muscle, it says we can be less efficient with calories, especially if it's getting sufficient nutrients because it doesn't feel like it needs to become more efficient. So I've seen, look, I'll tell you what, I've had clients go gain five pounds of lean body mass. Okay. And I know through body fat testing, a lot of stuff, just five pounds. And yet we're eating 800 more calories a day. Like, does that mean each pound of, uh, of muscle is a hundred and something, you know, calories a day? No, it's just that range of more versus less efficiency. It's not only that, um, you know, when we first started the podcast, we talked a lot about neat. We haven't talked about neat in a really long time. Um, and I shared, uh, I don't know if it was on my story or when we were having this conversation before, on uh, when I'm lifting and training consistently, something that I notice about myself is I my neat naturally picks up, and you're not going to see this measured in a six to twelve week study. The, the, it's mm -hmm. too the, it's too difficult to try and measure what everybody's neat is going to be throughout the day after this. The, all they want to be able to say is like, oh, muscle burns this many more calories. Yeah. Well, there's other factors that building strength and and building muscle 
uh, has on your life, mm -hmm. uh, your energy levels, your activity, and and the things that you're just not really paying attention to. And I know or this the is, heat that you generate. You know, right. the, the heat that your body generates burns extra calories. Right, yeah. right. I mean, uh, and, and I'm sure, I hope most people can attest to this that you, you ever notice, like if you've you haven't trained consistently for a while, how kind of lethargic and kind of lazy you feel, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you get back into your strength training and, and being consistent again. Now all of a sudden you have more energy, like you you get up earlier or you move more at lunchtime or you. You come like I was using the example of I come home. I anytime I have a day where when I lift here and then when I get home because I got to drive for a while, right? So it normally, man, after sitting in here at the podcast in this little cave and then sitting in my car driving home, if I don't train those days, man, I just want to go. I'm tired. I go home and I'm all, I feel all lazy. I just lay in the lay on the couch, kind of play with Max on the floor. I'm not really physical. If I lift and then I go home. Man, I come home and I'm 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 more active the way I play with him. I'm doing dishes. You, you're not going to measure that in a study. I'm not going to show you that, but the, the, it's a direct reflection yeah. of me strength training and lifting and building muscle and how I feel. But even even with that, even if you controlled for all activity, because there's studies I've referred to this in the book, the uh, Resistance Training Revolution, where they study modern hunter gatherers, and they move way more than the average Western couch potato. And yet they weren't burning similar amounts of, ca of calories. Why their bodies, their metabolisms adapted. They, they And they moved way more. So there's a range of efficiency. You can even do this. Like you could take a man with low testosterone, give him testosterone and have his, have his testosterone levels go up to high. Okay. Change nothing else. Don't change his activity. Don't change his diet. Do nothing else. And what do you see? Body fat loss, muscle gain. And it's not a huge effect, but it happens because hormones signal that. So it's way more complex then one pound of muscle equals this many calories. It's more like the process and the signaling of building muscle combined with feeding your body appropriately tells it it doesn't need to adapt in a way to where it slows its metabolism. It, it tells it to speed its metabolism up to become less efficient. And this is why reverse dieting, how many times you've seen someone reverse diet, there's no change of weight in the scale. You don't even see a body fat or muscle change yet. It's the same. And yet, wow, how am I eating 300 more calories a day and not gaining any weight? There's a range there. And the, the mammalian metabolism is extremely complex. We know that it can become more efficient, less efficient. So that's how we're so does gaining strength boost your metabolism? Probably. If you're stronger in the gym, you're probably moving towards the metabolism boosting end of that spectrum. Next question is from Tax Free Mitt. What are your favorite pieces of old school bodybuilding wisdom when it comes to training and nutrition? <laughs> oh man, I like this. Yeah, it's a good one. I'm, let me think. Um, you I know, got lots, dude. Yeah, there's a lot of old wisdom that is kind of interesting. Like, uh, there are not even studies to support it. Like, I like, I like pyramid sets, which uh, that's old school. A pyramid set would be like you did four sets, and what you did is you you go up in weight, and then halfway through your work, the the sets, then you start to drop down the weight. Mm. I just like the way it feels. It kind of matches my strength curve as I'm going through the sets. So that's, you know, that's one thing I like to do. I like all the stuff that's been debunked. That I still think it's got some value like to cardio, it. Like cardio, cardio first I, thing I, I love fasted cardio. I love small meals. I uh, I love carrying the gallon of water around. All the things that we know we've debunked yeah. and we, for the, the reasons that they were sold to you, why you should do it. But I still think there's like, wisdom in utilizing it like I, it's I, all based on behaviors that's it why. is yeah it, mm -hmm. and that's the, that's the, the problem is and that's why I like I really uh you know I still like to defend it because we, we've now debunked that right we know that six meals a day does not speed up your metabolism doesn't stoke this fire the the benefits of that versus if all cal all things are equal the same but I have found with clients and myself there's lots of things that help out by breaking the meals up. Yeah, it can be a pain in the ass. Do I think that it's a big deal if I don't one day? No, it's yeah. not a big deal. But I love that still. I love the idea of getting up first thing in the morning before I eat or do anything like that and going for a walk or getting on the treadmill and walking for a half hour to an hour to start my day. Um, not because it burns more body fat than if I were to do it at two o'clock in the afternoon or whatever. It's just, it's kickstarting my day with movement that I would be sleeping in my bed had I not done that. And you're and more the, likely to be active. Yes. The and day. then the, it sets the tone for the rest of my day. So I love that. The carrying the gallon of water. Most people don't need a whole gallon of water. But what I have found that is when I'm carrying that thing around, it holds me accountable to be yeah. sipping on water all day long. So I like those things. You man. know, my favorite old school bodybuilding wisdom comes from really old school bodybuilding before mm -hmm. body, the, the golden the, era. Well, even before that, the golden era is often <laughs> typically referred favorite. to as like the 70s, 60s and 70s. <laughs> yeah. 
But I even like I like going back even further before the widespread use of uh, anabolic steroids and hormones because mm -hmm. the advice that they gave, in my opinion, is more applicable to the average person. For example, if you read like Steve Reeves workouts and John Grimmick's workouts and all these bodybuilders before you, Eugene Sandow even, he was at the turn of the of the 19th century, right? You're just, you read about what they would say and they would say things like, don't train to exhaustion. Make sure that you have energy for your next workout. Practice your lifts. That's what they used to say, right? Practice your lifts often. They wouldn't even say, go beat yourself up. They would say, go practice. They all trained full body three days a week, very basic type routines, and they developed incredible physiques. So, and that wisdom applies uh, today. I think, um, you know, I grew up in the 90s and I would read bodybuilding magazines from the 90s and it was all about extreme intensity with the workouts. It wasn't until I found the old, old school stuff that I applied that, man, my body really started to respond really well um, to some of that stuff. Yeah, well, it was cool when, when bodybuilding had more uh, strength components to like the competing side of it where they'd have to like, didn't they used to have to do like um, some kind of calisthenic routine or something? Along the, the, the very the first ones, ones, it was like, yeah, you would do something physical and then you would yeah. do the posing. Well, I mean, my favorite is the golden era where they would, uh, you'd see them all eating like a huge amount of protein outside. And then they go do workouts outside in the sun and yeah. like, you know, get all the benefits from that. But yeah, I don't know, dude, I'm, I wasn't as much of a geek on bodybuilding. Yeah. Videos. Another one would be like old school, uh, bodybuilders would say, um, to bring out definition in your muscles, uh, do, uh, lots of flexing and posing. So this was actually something mm. that Arnold did, you know, and before competition, he would, at the end of his routine, he'd flex In other words, and isometrics have a lot of isometrics. Yeah. Isometrics, right? But I mean, they didn't, they didn't understand necessarily why it worked. They yeah. just know that they just saw that, Hey, this works. But if you break it down, it's like, well, yeah, you're doing isometrics. Um, well, the doing, only time I super said it was because of uh, bodybuilding type workouts. So I, I definitely love doing that and, and just the hypertrophy in general. Like it's such a different shift of a mindset. Yeah. You know? I remember reading uh, old magazines and Arnold would say that he preferred to work out his calves with in barefoot. I like working out my, my calves barefoot. I feel better contraction, whatever. It sounds stupid. Try it. Try yeah. doing calf raises barefoot. Try yeah. doing, you'll feel. It's not that stupid squeeze. at all. Imagine uh, you working out with big old gloves, like snow gloves, because that's what shoes are like yeah. for your yeah. feet. You know what I'm saying? Well, no, it makes sense now that yeah. we're experienced, we yeah. understand. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. and spraying your toes out yeah. and getting more nerve yeah. uh, connections. Like, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, yep. There's a lot. There's a lot of old bodybuilder wisdom that, unfortunately, I think is uh, people trash because of how it was communicated back then. Exactly. And so, you know, oh, they they take they hang on the exact words that they use to describe or or, or explain why they do it, and then they shit all over it with some controlled study. Here's, some, say, here's something, right? This and this has all been debunked. <clears throat> debunked. Like um, concentration curls build the peak of the bicep. Preacher curls build the bottom of the bicep. Hammer curls build thickness in the bicep. This is literally what they would say back in the day. Is that all true? No. But what is true is all of those different angles in combination in a workout is a great way to work your bicep. So the way they explained it was this works this part, this works that part, this works that part, which, you know, if you look at the bicep anatomy, it doesn't really work that way. Yeah. However, if you listen to them and you just, <coughs> and, and, and you did those exercises, you get a full workout versus just doing the same exercise over and over again. So a lot of it has to do with the explanation. Next question is from Nebs Fitness. You guys talk a lot about novelty when it comes to exercise. Does that apply to mobility movements as well? Oh, good question. Yeah. Different adaptation. Yeah, but also yeah. we need to be clear when we talk about novelty because it can get away from us where people are like, I'm going to do something different all the time because it's so novel. You, it, there's a lot of value in practicing the same movement over and over again to get better and better at it, to continue to reap uh, benefits from them. Mm -hmm. So novelty does have value, but it's don't trade it for getting, you know, perfecting a movement. So well, and, and to that point, that's why you don't want to switch up the mobility stuff the same way. No, because you want to get really good at that. Yeah. Like, that's the idea. So yeah, there's there's a different focus here, right? When we are, when it's we're, less about progressive overload. It's more about like you're really teaching your body this new 
way of of moving and and connecting to that. Yeah, you're far. You be in fact, you'd be far better off picking two or three mobility moves that you see really help you or improve and getting better and better yeah. and better at that than like, oh, I saw this person doing this one. I want to try that out, and then right. this one, and then this one, and that one. Like, you're you're trying to increase a a range of motion in a joint or gain gain better connectivity uh, to a muscle. Um, practicing the same mobility movements over and over and over is is going to benefit you more than cycling through all these different. Which is why, if you've ever heard us on the show, sometimes we get somebody calls in and they're they're asking about like our Prime or Prime Pro. There's a ton of mobility drills in there, and they're like, "I failed everything. I'm bad here, bad bad here." And our advice isn't go follow all of those. We right. normally tell people like, "Hey, you know what? Pick a couple of those movements that are that you find help you the most." And then stick to those and get really good at those versus telling them like to try all these different movements, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, unless like your goal is to become like this crazy yogi or somebody that can do like um, very challenging uh, flexibility poses and things where it's like, yeah, novelty will definitely play a factor in that because you're going to need to be able to sort of contort your body in directions and you have to train yourself to do that in ways that challenge Yeah, you. but novelty is not the same as variety. Yeah. So variety is different than novelty. Novel means new. I've never done this before. Right, and, do it now. and you would be switching and replacing. You'd be like, oh, this I'm going to do lizard with rotation today. Tomorrow I'm going to do 99. Right. Oh, tomorrow I'm going to do combo. Never really fully reaping the right. benefits of right. each one because you have to practice it. Like the first time you do combat stretch. That's what you're saying. So not like interrupting it and then backing out. Well, no, what you're saying, what I picture what you're saying is like this. Like, it's like okay. someone doing a lot of things. Yeah, doing a lot of things. Oh, today I did lizard with rotation. Now I'm going to yeah. add on top of my lizard yes. rotation this one. And then, oh, I'm also going to add this. Yeah, like it's, it's a progression in that Yeah, because you're, you're completely adding adding to all the things you're doing that's different and that that it, to your point you were making okay i understand that 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 has some value if you want to become this you know this super mobile mobility person uh then okay uh go that way but i think what sal is, is pointing out and, and i agree with is like what you don't want to do is like one day you're doing 90 90 and then the next day you all of a sudden switch to a you know a, a different movement completely like you haven't even reaped the benefits of getting yep. better at that night. It took me yeah. the the ninety ninety in combat stretch were the two probably most common ones that I that I did for those you know two years. I was really driving home the mobility thing, and I was doing those those two movements three times a day yep. every day for years yeah. to to get to really reap the benefits of improving my squat depth, and I did I improved it tremendously. Like, but I what would have been a bad strategy would have been like every other day changing all those up and doing different ones. Right. I don't think I'd, I would have reaped the same. Benefits. Right. And also there's different ways to, to include novelty where you don't um, run into the problem that we're kind of describing where you, you stop getting good at a movement. So for example, uh, we'll, we'll talk about exercise, for example. So barbell squat. Okay. You can, if you look at a lot of our programs, a barbell squat is, com is in the entire program, but we continue to inject novelty. How do we do that? You change the reps. You can change the tempo right? Uh, you could change the amount of sets. So let's say you're doing a mobility movement and you've been practicing it and you want to inject some novelty, slow it down, speed it up, do it longer, do it shorter, do it more frequently. That also is yeah. novel. You don't have to completely change everything to do, to include novelty. Yeah, you, know, you can lift your back leg up. I mean, there's yes. progressions within those poses, I guess, yes. is what you're... And I, I agree. Like, So there's foundational poses, I think, that address real common issues uh, with alignment and, and getting your body to function properly. So stay within those core movements, add the additional progressions within that. Exactly. Right. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. Adam is also on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal.